everyone. My name is Mega Devraj. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft. So I'm very excited to introduce our keynote speaker, Shomit Ghosh. Uh, he's a lecturer at UC Berkeley, as well as a partner at Clear Vision Ventures. And today he's going to help us demystify the T in ChatGPT, and he's going to show us all the doors that have really been opened. So here's Shomit. All right. All right, so here we are. So uh, imagine this. It's the uh, year 1800 or so, and you see what is actually the first harnessing of electricity, which is the arc light. Imagine if you thought, wow, this is wonderful, arc lights, no more whale oil lamps, right? And you neglect to think about what's actually powering the arc light, which is electricity and all the wonderful things that electricity can do. It's kind of the moment where we find ourselves right now with chat GPT and the underlying technology, which is T, the transformer. Uh, how many people here have actually tried out chat GPT? Pretty cool, right? Yeah, how many people cheated in a homework with it? Okay, there we go, all right, thank you for that. All right, let's see if we can advance this. There we go. All right, so, you know, there's all this excitement about chat GPT. Uh, deservedly so. It is pretty cool. I've used it. I love it. But the thing is, is that it works because of the, the transformer, the underlying technology. When you think about the opportunities for enterprise applications, it's actually come from, coming from the T, the transformer. So that's what we'll talk about. Um, quite a lot of, uh, you know, hoopla in the press nowadays about you know, how much disruption chat GPT will bring to existing big tech players and certainly will disrupt some, but actually the real disruption actually lies in enterprise. Um, even on the, the um, consumer facing chat side, as far as whether the big players get disrupted, I'm actually a little bit doubtful and here's why. Um, one reason is that um, large language models are commoditized and there are lots of different offerings that are out there. And any time you have a commoditized market, the big players win. They win because they're already getting our services from something else. So as far as disruption coming to any of the big, big players, I don't see that. I think, in fact, it's just going to reinforce their dominance on the, uh, on the consumer side. Um, even with chat, if you look at chat GPT, which does a great job of you know, responding to prompts, um, I wonder here, I'm going to go out on a limb and predict that, uh, Google still wins this battle. And the reason for that is that they have so many different prompts about me personally. If I want to write an email to my wife saying, hey, let's go out to dinner for your birthday, not only does Google know the prompt, but I'm going to guess they're going to be using everything else, which is everything, that Google knows about me. You know, they know how old I am basically by listening to or looking at what I listen to on, on, uh, on YouTube. They know where my wife and I like to go to dinner because, you know, uh, they see where, what we search for on Google Maps, et cetera. So multimodal prompts, I think, will come into play, which to me spells the big players winning once again. And of course, um, chat is pretty computationally intensive, uh, seven times the power of um, a standard internet search. So once again, the winners here end up being the ones who have the access to the biggest server farms. And when it comes to generative AI, by the way, if you look at what Google specifically has, a pretty broad and deep arsenal. So they can do everything from generating images and videos from a text prompt to generating music from a text prompt. So as far as you know, companies like Google getting disrupted, I don't think so. I think their position actually gets solidified. So, so I know all of you here are involved in the technology business or the business of technology. Um, Think about the following. Think about does your company rely on, transact on sequenced data? Okay, sequenced data where the position of the data matters. What is language? Language is sequenced data and the position of the words matters. So I could say Shomit ate the chicken, same bag of words. The chicken ate Shomit, same words, but just by permuting the nouns, completely different meanings. So when um, when the work was done, initial work was done by Voswani et al. in 2017, to actually understand language, um, how do we break apart sequences of data elements where positionality matters, and this is what the transformer does really well. I know it's a very technical audience here. Some of you know this stuff way better than I do, but if you haven't been introduced to transformers yet, we'll walk through it really quickly and we'll see how it applies to enterprise applications. So um, in language, of course, not only do the words themselves have meaning, but the positionality also matters. But it turns out the same is true with industrial data. 
There we go. Um, so um, once again, you can ask yourself in what applications might you be transacting today where you have a lot of sequence data and the positionality matters. And actually what happened here with the, the transformer work that was done initially at Google in 2017 is by solving the language problem, uh, by extension they solved so many other problems which actually exist in industry today. Um, and all of this data, by the way, is nicely processed in parallel. So here's the transformer simplified. Um, again, you can read the Voswani paper. I recommend that people read that to get a full picture of this. This is just a simplified diagramming of it so that we can use this as a feed into why it applies in the enterprise. So think about translating here the Spanish text La Casa Blanca to the English the White House. So we have to understand both the meaning of the sequence of data that's coming in and there's posi posi ah, positionality there which is uh, specific to Spanish and the English interpretation also has positionality in it. So we're taking positionality and meaning in and we're outputting uh, meaning and positionality. So on the left hand side we have the encoder. The encoder is taking this stream of sequenced information uh, where positionality matters. We're going to understand words by their position as well as their meaning and we're going to produce an output sequence of tokens. And on the decoder side, we're going to take those tokens and predict based on the first token what should the second token be, based on the second to token what should the third token be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until at the very end you, pre you predict end of sentence. Voila, you've done the translation. This is the transformer. What really makes it fly is that, that self-attention mechanism that you see there and we'll talk about that for just a sec. Okay, so this is it. Transformer simplified. Sequence data come in, comes in where positionality matters. Sequence data comes out where positionality matters. Generalizable beyond language. So look at this. Here we see self-attention at work. Let's say we say the chicken did not cross the road because it was too wide. What was too wide? The chicken or the road? We all know it was the road. So um, how do we figure that out? You know, historically it's, this has been a difficult thing for natural language processing to figure out. Uh, the transformer actually solved this. So here we see the self-attention mechanism once again and self-attention really refers to it's a statistical mechanism and what it's doing is interpreting each word in the se input sequence and modifying that meaning based on all the other words in the input sequence. Okay, so works really well in language, turns out it works really well in industry too. But this is it. So here's my, my little inside joke, the enterprise question. Okay, because here's Captain Kirk on the Starship Enterprise, that's the joke. And if you remember, uh, he actually used to use natural language processing to interface with the computer. If he was like, you know, presage Alexa, et cetera. He would say, computer, and then the computer would answer the question. So here's Captain Kirk asking, is language the only place where we see sequence data where positionality has meaning? And again, if you're involved in the technology business, ask yourself that. In, in your company, are you also processing sequence data and positionality has meaning? And if the answer is yes, you're a, a great candidate for a transformer. So let's look at some enterprise applications. Sequence data in with positionality, sequence data out with positionality. Uh, some quick examples here. Uh, there's work done with both with BERT and MedBERT inputting electronic health records. Because let's say I suffer a heart attack, right? Did that heart attack appear out of thin air? No, there were actually, there was positionality on the signals that preceded it. So maybe I had high blood pressure, elevated heart rate, high blood sugar, et cetera, and it culminates in a heart attack. Positionality matters. Sequence data or positionality matters. With, um, with BERT, they predicted hundreds of downstream health effects. Right, wonderful. Think about now processing cybersecurity logs. So here we see how it applies in healthcare. What about cybersecurity? Um, just as, you know, that hacker didn't mysteriously appear in the middle of your network, there were, uh, there were signals that preceded it. In the same way, Cybert runs through log files and does threat class classification. Drug design. Our bodies are composed of proteins. Proteins are collections of amino acids. Those amino acids are not just random collections of molecules and, and chemicals. Positionality matters. Can you feed an amino acids and predict a drug binding on the other side? Absolutely. So the very same transformer you can use to translate German to French, you know, French to English, et cetera, you can also use to do drug design. Um, this was actually a pretty cool example too. This uh, was integrating IoT sensor input 
to predict when machine failure might occur. What was most striking to me about this was the accuracy was a near, near 100%. So we've talked about you know, industrial IoT, healthcare, drug discovery, all from the transformer. Um, another, just a quick summary of some other uh, projects that have been done, I'll call your attention to the very first one there, which is actually doing code generation. Code has a language syntax, right? Can you feed in um, a prompt and get code out? Absolutely. In this case, the uh, transformer generated code outperformed 54% of human programmers. All right. So anyway, so this is why, you know, if you're in the business, whatever business you're in, if you have sequence data and positionality matters, transformers are your solution. Chat is wonderful, but chat is just one application of the transformer. It's not the only one. We have so many industrial applications out there. To be on the cutting edge, you, know, you need to be on transformers too. So what's next in generative AI? Um, I'm going to predict that this is what it's going to be. Um, all of this stuff with using diffusion networks to generate images works really well for two-dimensional images. As with transformers, is this all we'll be able to do with it or might there be industrial applications? So when this starts to also get into the, into the public press, as it will, be the knowing person that says, yeah, it works great for images, also works great in industry. And if you look at the work that's been done with diffusion networks, um, energy forecasting on the left-hand side, epidemiology, a couple of examples on the bottom on robotics, quite a bit on drug discovery, and also cybersecurity. The very same diffusion technology that you might use, actually, to create a two-by-two -two image. So as these AI technologies get developed, my call to all of you is look beyond just the consumer applications, see what the applications might, there might be for industry. Um, as with all things that are data-driven, AI specifically, I know there's a follow-on topic coming up here uh, in today's session, but um, there's a risk of hallucination. Okay, so it might be amusing or disquieting. I think everyone may have seen that the New York Times guy got the computer to say that it was love, in love with him and get divorced and move to Maui, something like that. Anyway, um, and that might be funny in a consumer application, but if your industrial application hallucinates, bad things can happen. People might get hurt, money might get lost. Something to be aware of. Hallucination doesn't go away. Um, I'm of the mind that hallucination is inevitable. And we'll wrap up with this. So you can read the, the uh, caption there in the cartoon from the New Yorker. If you can't read it, basically the scientists are standing behind the robots are saying, the robots have become self-aware and now all they do is to write novels, you know, bemoaning their, their fate. But this is actually what, what actually does happen in the field of AI. AI is trained by, on the data that we, we produce and human beings have all these things. You know, we're bigoted, we're racist, we may be depressed, et cetera. If that's what ends up training the AI, it actually gets reflected in the AI. So that never goes away. So we have to always be aware of that. But the T in, in GPT, you'll see all the hype about GPT. GPT deserves all that hype. But as a business, um, business to business pr practitioner in the enterprise, think hard about the transformer. And with that, thank you very much. And there's an article you can find talking about it.